you bow your heads in a word of prayer with me? Lord, open our eyes and ears and our hearts to receive and accept our worship this day. Amen. Good morning. Happy Palm Sunday. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood, and um, I'm glad you're here. I want to read some scripture from the book of Luke, the 19th chapter, verses 28 through 44. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you why you are untying it, tell them the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, the owners asked them, Why are you untying the colt? And they replied, The Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God to, in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come when you will... Your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. May the Lord add blessing to the reading of those rude words from the book of Luke. Does anyone remember pet rocks? Anybody? Anybody have one pet rock? Anybody? Anybody still have their pet rock? Just wondered. In April of 1975, a guy named Gary Dahl was in the bar drinking with his friends, and he was listening to them complain about their pets and how they had to walk them and take them to the vet. And they had to clean up after him on the street. This gave him an idea for a perfect pet. He thought, a rock. Think about it. A rock would not need to be fed. It wouldn't need to be walked, bathed, or groomed. Furthermore, pet rocks would not die, get sick, or be disobedient. And he said they would be perfect as pets and joked about this with his friends. But he later took this idea a little further and simply, than simply sharing uh, this with his few of his drinking buddies. He began selling ordinary gray stones bought at a builder supply store as pet rocks. Those rocks were marketed like live pets in custom cardboard boxes complete with straw and holes in the boxes to allow the rocks to breathe. He also drafted an instruction manual for the pet rock, and it was full of puns and gags and plays on words. And the rest, as they say, is history. Only in America, right? Could you a gag like a pet rock become a big business? This fad lasted about six months in 1975. Gary Dahl died in 2015. He sold 1.5 million pet rocks 
and he died a millionaire. You can still buy a pet rock with a walking leash and everything on Amazon.com. You can do it. What a great country we live in, huh? Yes, sir, boy. I have a pet rock. Well, I do. I do. I didn't get it from Amazon, no. I got it under a holly tree in our backyard just, just last week. It was a rock until I talked to our good friend and neighbor, Renee Rom. She was walking her dog, and I had this rock, and I ran up to her, and I said, Hey, Renee, I got an idea. I, 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 I want you, would you do me a favor? She wondered what it was, and I said, Do you remember pet rocks? And she said, No, which indicates how much younger she is than me, which was not nice, but anyhow. Um, I explained to her the concept of a pet rock, and how they come about. And I said, would you paint me a pet rock? I got a rock here. And she said, yeah, I'd like that challenge because Renee is a very wonderful artist. She truly is. She creates beautiful things. And I handed it to her and she said, well, that looks like a potato. And I said, well, you can use your imagination. Anything you want, two-legged, four-legged, winged, it doesn't make any difference. Make something. She said, I like any time I can get my brushes out, that's what I want to do. And so she took it. The next day, the phone rings. And it's Renee, and she says, it's on your front porch. And I went out, and it was in a bag. And I opened it up. And there it is. It looks like a potato, don't it? Because it's brown and it looks like a potato. But when you turn it around, this is the personality that Renee gave it. It's a big-eyed owl, a big-eyed owl, and it's my pet rock. And because it looks like a potato, its name is Spud the Owl. And you can come up and see Spud the Owl later on. And I thank Renee for indulging me in doing that for me. I appreciate it so much, uh, just uh, indulging an old man. Thank you. And I'll get back to Pet Rocks a little later, okay? St. Francis of Assisi said that true Christianity is a radical experiment that has only been tried once. St. Francis of Assisi gave up everything because of his love for Christ. The story is told that St. Francis was on a pilgrimage one time, and he's singing. And he's going down the road, and he's singing. And someone asked him where he was going. And he said, I'm going to God. And they said, well, where are you coming from? And he said, I'm coming from God. And they said, why do you sing? And he said, I sing to keep from losing my way. That's the image of Jesus as he enters Jerusalem on this first, this first Palm Sunday. The sun's out, you see, and the birds are singing and, and dogs are barking and kids are playing and they're running around and they're laughing. And it's a beautiful day for a parade, a parade. And Jesus is happy. He knows where he's coming from. He knows where he's going. And his eyes are fixed on God. And there's a song in his heart. There's a song in his heart that day. That's a very heartwarming thought, don't you think? I mean, it's true. Jesus knows where he's coming from. And he knows where he's going. But he also knows that there's going to be a whole lot of pain in between. A whole lot of pain. Palm Sunday is Jesus' coming out party. This is where he presents himself to the world as the Messiah. This is where he presents himself. Every once in a while, we have the opportunity to present ourselves to other people, whether it's through a, a, a casual introduction 
or a, a job interview or a speaking engagement or even a first date. Sometimes those presentations go very well. They do. And sometimes they don't. A young man um, goes into the boss of a company for a job interview. And the boss says, boy, just what I like to see in my company, a bright young man ready for the challenges of a new position. And you say you just got out of Yale. That's my alma mater too. Now, son, what's your name again? And the boy says, Jones. Jones, who just got out of Yale. You got it? Jones. Sometimes when we try to present ourselves to others, things go very well. We get up and we get a, we get a good response. But sometimes they don't. But usually it's important to us that we make a good impression. They say that it's never too late to make a good first impression. I don't know about that. don't sound too right. But, but how sweet it is when our efforts are met with success when our efforts are appreciated and applauded. Jesus is about to present himself to the holy city of Jerusalem on this day. Up till now, Jesus has been reluctant to make his mission official. He's been preaching and teaching and healing for three years now. And you remember, he would always tell people, don't tell anyone what I've done for you. Don't do that. Or don't tell anyone who I am. He even told his disciples, don't tell nobody. But now you see, now's the time. It's his time. God's time has come. The time of preparation is over. The time for presentation is at hand. It's now. Jerusalem will be Jesus' big reveal. If you're not familiar with the term, the reveal, it's also known as the big reveal. It's a plot device, you see, in storytelling. Somebody's telling you hey, this is a plot device. It refers to the moment when a previously hidden key element in the story or the plot is exposed to the audience. It's that aha moment. When you say, this is where the narrative's heading. This is what the author wanted to get across. This is where he's making the turn to head us down the right path. Palm Sunday is Jesus' big reveal. Jesus is headed to Jerusalem. He has come up from Jericho. As he approaches Bethage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sends two of his disciples ahead and says to them, Go to the village ahead of you. And as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you why you are untying it, say, The Lord needs it. Jesus is clearly fulfilling Zechariah's prophecy that the Messiah will ride a donkey. Zechariah 9, 9 and 10 tells us that. But what is the significance of the Messiah riding on a donkey? And it's just this. All of Israel was waiting for a Messiah who would be a political revolutionary. They expected the Messiah to come riding on a horse with his sword drawn, prepared to overthrow the Roman oppressors. They had somehow missed Zechariah's prophecy. See, in the days of Zechariah, when a king came riding on a horse, he was announcing his intention to declare war on that enemy. But when the king came riding on a donkey, he was announcing his intention to make peace with his enemies. Jesus' entry into Jerusalem on a donkey was an announcement that he had come to usher in a kingdom of peace. Riding on a donkey was a, prophet, a prolific declaration of his purpose and his mission. 
not just for Jews, but for all humanity. All humanity. He came in peace. And to bring peace. A peace that without Jesus would can never not we can't know it. Without Jesus, we can't know this kind of peace. Jesus had prepared all his life for this day, especially the last three years. He's 33 at this point. He's been preaching for three years. It was a divine appointment, so much so that the owners of the donkey was agreeable when they were told, the Lord needs it, you know? See, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Lord, went ahead of the disciples and prepared the hearts of the owners of the colt. So that when they got there, they untied it and they said, that's okay. Just take it. If he needs it, that's great. There's good news in that as well. Think about it. You see, when God has a plan, okay, and a purpose, nothing can stand in his way. If God says his kingdom is coming, it's time for us to join the planning committee. The Lord has need of it. The Lord has need of you. That's all it took, and the disciples throw their cloaks on the donkey, making a saddle for Jesus to ride triumphantly into Jerusalem to begin the process of bringing in his kingdom of peace. This is how he was going to enter the city of Jerusalem, riding on a donkey. Jesus advanced down the west side of the Mount of Olives toward the city, and he was welcomed by crowds of, as the Messiah. They were cheering and they were clapping and they were so happy. And they threw their cloaks on the ground and palm branches to form a carpet as a way of showing their respect for Jesus. And the whole crowd of believers began to joyfully praise God for all the miracles that he had, that, that he had done and that they had seen in his ministry. And they said, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory to the, on the, to the highest. Luke's the only gospel writer who uses the word peace and glory. The other writers use the word Hosanna, and we're used to that in Easter season. Hosanna, Hosanna, but Luke uses peace and glory because Luke's Gentile audience would not have understood the word Hosanna, so he uses peace and glory. The fact that the crowds welcomed Jesus like they did with all this cheering and hoopla, and they were just overwhelmed with Jesus. It troubled the Pharisees. They were upset. They were mad. They were scared. And they told Jesus, you rebuke your followers. Shut them up. Quiet them down. And to this, Jesus replied, I tell you, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. Imagine that, the stones or rocks crying out. I told you I'd get back to, to, to pet rocks. If the crowds kept silent, all the pet rocks would be crying out. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. What Jesus is telling them is this. Nothing can stop this movement. Nothing. If the crowds were silent, even inanimate objects would be raised up to testify, to testify that he is the Messiah. He's the one. All of history was preparing for this one single event when he would be declared as king. Luke clearly paints the picture that this was a divinely orchestrated event. It was orchestrated by God Almighty. Luke takes, on, takes us on a journey to help us understand that nothing can stop or frustrate what God has already predestined to happen. Nothing will stop it. Later in Revelation 6, Jesus will be presented as riding on a horse. 
That's when the kingdom of God will come in its fullness. A kingdom of peace and of love where every tear will be wiped away and every wrong will be made right. That kingdom will be a, a particularly good news for those who have been oppressed and those who suffer so much. Here's what Palm Sunday says to us today. This Palm Sunday. Nobody will be left out of God's kingdom, regardless of the challenges they've faced in this life. You see, your King God says to us, that he's coming on riding on a donkey. And then we thank God for that. But later, when it's time, according to Revelation 6, you'll see him on a white horse. But for now, on this occasion, it's a donkey. The Messiah comes with peace and humility on this day. Maybe Jesus was singing as he entered the city that day. Maybe he was humming a tune. I don't know. Could have been. He could see what lay ahead for sure, the cross. He knew that was coming. He knew the pain that was going with it. But beyond the cross, you see, he could see the resurrection. And then further on down, he could see the ascension, to be with God the Father again. And further on, he could see Pentecost, when the church would be empowered to carry out his, his ministry. And then he could see all the way down to today, 2024, when we would be at Robinson Street, gathered here in worship to sing his praise, and then he could see all the way to the end of time when all the saints of God will be gathered together around the throne to sing God's praises forever. And, and, if there's any pet rocks there, they'll be singing too. After all, Jesus said on that first Palm Sunday as the people uh, shouted their praise, he said, I tell you, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. This is of God, and nobody can stop it. Pray with me. Lord God, we thank you so much that this day happened, that Jesus saw all the way down to here with us in this church building. Help us to cry out, Lord. Help us never to stop our crying out and telling people of the love of Jesus and what he did for us, how he saved us by going to the cross and dying and then raising again and ascending to God the Father. Lord, this is not just a fable or a fairy tale. This is true. This is true. And we need as Christians to, pre to present it to other people. So Lord, prepare us for that as we go into this Easter season. Amen. <clears throat> you feel it in your everyday life. God holding us near to his heart. He sent his son for one purpose and one purpose only. And that was to save us. Each and every one of us. No matter what, no matter how bad we've, we've gone left or right. He sent Jesus to save us. And he went to that cross and he died, but he rose again. He withheld, he, with, he withstood Palm Sunday. But he lives to tell us that we can live also near to the heart of God. Pray with me. Lord God, we just ask that you would keep us in the palm of your hand, close to your heart. Help us when we wiggle away to grab, to, to grab us and pull us back. But sometimes we do, Lord. We just want to wiggle away and we know better. But Lord, we place ourselves in your hands until we meet again. Amen.
don't make mistakes You don't make things you 